Welcome to our review on photosynthesis. So the first thing we actually need to consider is where do the reactants of photosynthesis actually come from and how do they get into the plants? So we've got two reactants that we need to know about. First one is carbon dioxide, which is going to come from the air that surrounds those plants and it actually enters through the stomata by a process called diffusion. So in the bottom left, you can see that's actually a diagram of a leaf and the little things outlined in yellow, those are the stomata, the pores that enter the leaf. The second thing is water, which is gonna come from our soil and that's gonna enter the plant through the roots. Or if you're gonna be more specific and want to talk about what increases their surface area, you could say the root hair cells and that's going to actually enter the plant through a process called osmosis. Bottom right there you can see the microscope image of the actual root hair cells so they're the little bits sticking off the side of the roots to increase the surface area. So what actually happens in photosynthesis? We need to know both the word and symbol equations for this. So our plants start off with two reactants carbon dioxide and water and they're going to then make our two products, glucose and oxygen. So you've got the word equation at the top, and remember, if it asks you for a word equation, make sure you write the full words, don't abbreviate it to the symbols. And underneath we have our balanced symbol equation, so 6CO2 plus 6H2O makes C6H12O6, which is glucose plus 6O2. When you're balancing it, there is that little trick you can remember of just putting sixes in front of everything but the glucose. And a nice little thing to remember is that if you've learned aerobic respiration, you may notice that this looks awfully familiar. It's exactly the same chemicals, just reversed. So where we're looking at photosynthesis, we start with carbon dioxide and water and end with our glucose and oxygen. Whereas if we think about the aerobic respiration, we start with glucose and oxygen and we make carbon dioxide and water. So if you've learnt one of those equations, just remember to flip it and you've learnt them both. When we consider where photosynthesis actually takes place in our plants, it's going to take place inside the chloroplasts. Now because of this, that means it generally occurs within the leaves, with a small quantity happening within the stem, because that's where we find the chloroplast located primarily in our plants, in the leaves. The reason that it will happen there is because our chloroplasts contain this green pigment called chlorophyll and it's the chlorophyll that's able to trap the light energy from the sun. And it's that light energy that we need to actually make photosynthesis take place. We do need to know that photosynthesis is a two stage process. The first stage is what's called the light dependent stage. So this is the one that needs light that light is actually used to split the water molecules into the oxygen and the hydrogen. So we've taken our H2O and we've split it into oxygen and hydrogen ions. Stage two is where we're actually going to have the light independent, so this doesn't need the light energy. But what happens here is that carbon dioxide is gonna combine with the hydrogen ions to make the glucose. So make sure that you do remember that photosynthesis takes place inside the chloroplasts and that it's this two stage process and remember what happens in each stage. When we're thinking about the type of reaction that photosynthesis is, it's what's called an endothermic reaction. Now that means it's going to take in energy from its surroundings in order to actually take place. The end result of photosynthesis, as we've said, is we're going to make our glucose and oxygen. Now, oxygen is actually technically a waste product that gets released into the surroundings of the plant, which is a bonus for us as humans because we kind of need that oxygen. The glucose, however, has a range of different uses within our plant, which is represented in that diagram on the slide there. So first and foremost, we can actually use the glucose we've made in photosynthesis for respiration. We could convert it into another sugar called sucrose, which is stored in the fruit. We may change it into starch by joining all the glucose together, and that then stores that glucose in the plant. We could use it to make the cellulose to make cell walls. We could actually add nitrogen to our glucose in order to make proteins. Or we could actually convert it into fats and oils, and again that's used as this food store. So now we know 
what glucose is actually used for, we know how we make the glucose, we know what photosynthesis actually is. But there's always the question of how do we know this? And the reason that we know all this about photosynthesis is because over the years we've had a whole range of different experiments carried out to actually get that knowledge. And one of the first ones that you should be aware of is this experiment that was carried out by Priestley back in 1772, so a few years ago. Now, Priestley, obviously we're talking about a different time, but he actually took a mouse and put it inside a sealed bell jar. And as surprising as it may be, the mouse died. Then he did exactly the same thing. He put his mouse into a sealed bell jar, but this time he had a little plant in there as well. And what he did was he watched to see what happened. The mouse still died but it took longer. So he came up with the idea that the plant is making the oxygen or something that keeps this mouse alive. While there were a number of other scientists who carried out various experiments to actually find out about photosynthesis, you need to know what experiments you could do to actually prove some of these things are true. So the first one that we would look at is how we test leaves for starch. So hopefully you did this as an experiment in class, but what you're going to do is you just take a leaf off the plant, place it in a beaker of boiling water for about a minute, and that's gonna kill off everything in the leaf. Now, what you then do is you take your leaf and place it in a boiling tube that contains ethanol. The whole idea behind that being is gonna remove all the chlorophyll, so that green pigment from the leaf. And you'll notice that when that's going on, the ethanol becomes slightly green in color and the leaf fades. Third step is you're then going to place the tube containing the leaf and the ethanol into a beaker of boiling water for five minutes. You are not going to hold that tube over an open flame, hopefully for the really obvious reason that ethanol is kind of flammable. So holding a flammable liquid above an open flame just leads to unexpected fires. So you put it in a beaker of boiling water because it's safe. Once you've done that, you take the leaf out, you give it a rock wash with water and spread it out on that white tile before adding a few drops of iodine solution. And hopefully we remember that iodine is gonna then react with any starch that's present to give it that black color. Now, one thing that we should remember here is that if you were going to be doing this experiment and testing any particular factor in terms of photosynthesis, then you need to do something called de-starching the plant. So basically you can remove any of the starch that's present within the plant before you carry out your actual trial. And the way we do that is just by putting the plant in the dark for 24 hours or more. So if we wanted to prove that chlorophyll is required for photosynthesis, then we'd start off by de-starching a variegated plant. And that's one I've shown you on the right there. So it's one of these that has chlorophyll in some areas, but not all. And what we then do is put that in a dark cupboard for 24 hours or more. Then you take the plant out, place it in sunlight for several hours, and then go through that process of testing the leaf for starch. And in theory, what you'll find is that only in the green parts, i.e. the bits that have the chlorophyll present, will we actually see the starch being made. Second experiment we could do is to prove that we need light for photosynthesis. So once more, we take a de-starched plant and this time what we're going to do is on a leaf, we're actually going to tape a bit of black card around it. So the idea being that that black card, or you could use some tin foil if you prefer, is going to prevent light getting to that part of the leaf. You then stick your plant in some sunlight for a few hours, come back, remove the card, take the leaf, test it for starch once more. And in theory, what you should find that if light is needed for photosynthesis, you will only have starch present in the bits that were not covered beforehand. In order to prove that we need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, we once more take a de-starched plant. You must be noticing a common theme here. You then take that plant and cover it with a polythene bag, which has got a pot of soda lime in there. Now, we put a pot of soda lime inside the actual plant bag because it's going to absorb carbon dioxide from the air. So you place that plant then in sunlight for several hours, then take off the bag, test the leaf for starch, etc. Because the soda lime has absorbed the carbon dioxide, what we should find is that we don't have any starch within those leaves. The last experiment that you could do is to prove that oxygen is actually given off by the plant when it's carrying out photosynthesis. And the way we tend to do that is by using a piece of pondweed. So you put your pondweed in a beaker as shown in the diagram at the bottom right there, 
and we're going to collect the gas that it makes because it's a water plant which means that the bubbles of gas are going to travel up through the water and we can collect it in an upturned test tube you can then do a nice simple oxygen test take a glowing splint place it in the tube if it relights we've got oxygen so make sure you're aware of the different experiments that we can carry out to actually identify those different factors that we require for photosynthesis to take place.